everyone, and welcome to Fashioning Resurgence, a panel series co-presented by Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto and the School of Fashion at Ryerson University. Justine Dishnikaushin, my name is Justine Woods, and I am the lead facilitator of the Beating Circle at Ryerson University. And I am so excited to be moderating this panel tonight, discussing beadwork and beadwork circles as resurgent practices. Tonight we have a group of incredible bead workers here with us to have this exciting conversation and I'm just going to go through and introduce each of them and their bios. So we have uh, Adam Garnett Jones. Uh, Adam is a two-spirit screenwriter, director, bead worker, and novelist from Edmonton, Alberta. Adam has recently shifted his artistic practice away from writing and directing film and is focusing on writing fiction and creating custom beadwork primarily for Indigenous artists. His first novel, Fire Song, based on his film, was published in the spring of 2018. So welcome, Adam. We also have Teresa Stevenson here with us. Um, and Isqueo Rising is run by Teresa Stevenson named in homage to the resilience of Indigenous women and is focused on original handmade jewelry. Uh, Teresa Stevenson is Plains and Swampy Cree from Fisher River Cree Nation, Manitoba and George Gordon First Nation in Saskatchewan and she is currently based in Toronto. We have Christine uh, Tiencamp and Christine is, Métis, is from the Métis community of St. Louis, Saskatchewan and resides alongside the beautiful South Saskatchewan River. She is a Métis beadwork artisan and entrepreneur and draws inspiration from the Métis women in her life. We have Jamie Campbell with us tonight, an Anishinaabe uh, woman from Curve Lake First Nation in Ontario. In 2015, Jamie launched her own small business, White Otter Design Company, to incorporate her love of traditional Indigenous artistry with contemporary fashion and decor. Jamie's work takes inspiration from within her Anishinaabe culture, and she owes a great gratitude to the elders who have taught and continue to teach her the old ways. We also have Britt Ellis. Um, Britt Ellis, AKA Blue Hummingbird, is a multidisciplinary artist specializing in beadwork and cosmetic tattooing with a background in community work and counseling. She creates intricate one-of-a-kind pieces that inspire conversation and connection. Influenced by her love of pop culture, drag, and bull tattoo design, Britt aims to create a variety of works that speak to the complexity of Indigenous identities and experiences on Turtle Island. And finally, we have Katie Long... Oops, no, sorry. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> we have also Katie Longboat. Uh, Katie Longboat is Mohawk and Cree from Six Nations of the Grand River, currently residing in Toronto. She first learned to bead as a teenager and loves to create beaded medallions, jewelry, and canvases. She enjoys sharing her knowledge of and love of beadwork through teaching classes in the community and, is, and also incorporates beading into her profession as a child and youth counselor, facilitating beading circles for high, school for high school students. And now finally, we have Tanya Larson with us. And Tanya Larson designs contemporary Northern indigenous adornment based uh, on Gwich'in culture, created with land-based materials. She is innovative, driven, and dedicated to her art. Through social media, she promotes her culture, work, and her passion for reclaiming Indigenous knowledge. She earned a bachelor's degree in fine arts with a focus in jewelry and digital art at the Institute of American in May 2017. So I'm so excited that we have all of these incredible bead workers here with us tonight. And I would first like to start our panel by asking how is everybody doing? What are you all working on? How are we doing in these pandemic times? <laughs> I've got multiple projects on the go after a uh, slight lull in my production. I got uh, mittens I'm working on here that will eventually feature some beadwork, uh, fringe, you know, some fur. Um, and then I also have a medicine bag that I'm working on. 
see that. Now I'm trying to uh, finish this piece off and uh, another bead weaving project on the go. Nice. Piece. It's, uh, I'm wrapping it all in peyote. <laughs> trying to stay busy, I guess, uh, as much as I am able to, within the boundaries of uh, my limits on time because of school. <laughs> Um, would, would anyone like to share how they're how they're doing? Any of our our, our panelists? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, it just feels like it's such a hard question to answer these days. Um, I think fine. I think okay. Yeah. Um, I'm. I stopped beating for a while at the beginning of the pandemic. I don't really know. <clears throat> I don't know why. But it just felt like, um, yeah, it just felt like it's something that I wasn't really able to do for for a while there. But I've kind of pushed past it, and I think I think that um, different beating circles that I've been involved with have, have been really important to to being able to do that and kind of come back into making my work. Um, I'm working on like a, a, a yoke or a, a cape for a, a jingle dress dancer. I've got this iris in the middle with some, uh, and it's all on on birch bark. I'm trying to see how you can actually see it properly, but uh, oh. yeah. So the birch bark is like an applique. Um, so some of the the bark the bark is visible through some of the design, and then I'm beating really different sections of it. So that'll continue. Like there will be different be, uh, like birch bark applique all around. <clears throat> the the neckline and then I'll be connecting it all with with more beat uh, more beat work. So it's a it's a like the f most physically awkward uh, <laughs> and largest project that that I've worked on, um, but it's been uh, yeah it's been fun. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, it's getting there. Uh Hi everyone. <laughs> this is actually my first beating circle ever. I'm not gonna lie, like first time. So um, bear with me. But uh, yeah, I actually, some of you might know, but I'm right in the middle of a move and a reno at the moment into our new house. So it's kind of feeling like, um, I don't know, I guess it's really in line with the whole year and kind of like, like Adam said, that's a really hard question to answer. But um, for me, like, my house is other than my plants like there's no we don't own any furniture that's in here there's like it's basically empty um except like I've made this little space for myself that's like a table with my beads on it and a chair and a light and that's mm -hmm. like kind of where I've been existing at the moment um which actually is incredibly grounding so I'm grateful for that but um I just started a new pair of gardenia florals so they're just it's just a pattern right now I'm just stitching the centers down um but yeah i'm just working on that and i'm actually prepping for the toronto fashion week online marketplace uh, in a couple weeks and christmas is i think a lot of our busiest season so just kind of trying to keep up with all that and yeah thanks for having me katie how are you doing <laughs> it's nice to see you nice to see you too hi everybody uh, i'm doing good um yeah just uh I've been pretty busy. I, I work in schools, so it's been uh, quite a busy time since September. And so uh, going to work and then coming home and, and beating has really been my um, my way of winding down after, after a long day. So I've been working on a few things. I have uh, some medallions. Um, oh, I don't know if you can see. Oh, oh, there we go. Maybe that's better. I can turn this plate. Yeah, so just working on medallions. So I have that one and then started doing like a matching one kind of, but with really, really much brighter colors and neons and stuff. Um, and right now I'm designing something. So I'm working on this like big 24 by 12 um, design that's going to be all swirls and leaves and swirls and stuff. So that's what's next. And I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks for having me today. 
Well, thank you for being here. We're really excited to have you part of our conversation tonight. Um, Tanya, how are you doing? I'm wearing a pair of your earrings, which I absolutely love, and I wear them all the time. If I could sleep in them, I'd probably sleep in them, but I don't want to wreck the, <laughs> the little tufts. So how are you doing tonight? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, um, I'm doing good. Um, like Jamie said, this is like the busiest time of the year. Um, I'm terrible at actually beating in beating circles. <laughs> Every time I try to bead during a beading circle, I will like miss a bead, like do a line that's like completely off and stuff like that. So I'm just working on backing all of my earrings right now for some December sale. So I'm just doing all my backing for with caribou for the back. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to be working on that because it's less, um, I guess tiny work and it's more uh, general so I can actually enjoy the conversation. <laughs> Amazing. Wow, that um well, I have to oh wow, that all of that work just like blows my mind and I mean just looking through the screen I'm already like thinking about uh what I want to try and get on your website. So <laughs> so many beautiful pieces. Um, Christine, how are you doing? Um, I'm doing good, thank you. Um, I'm doing a few um, small projects. Um, I think with COVID, there definitely was, um, like everyone's kind of mentioned, um, kind of a, an interest in what we're doing, and it's just kind of a busy time of year, um, irregardless. But I think with COVID, it definitely um you know got people online <laughs> and also uh, sort of a renewed interest in um in the traditional arts which is really nice so i'm i've had lots of people ask about brooches so i'm actually doing something kind of a more of a traditional thing but in sort of just different trying different colors and stuff and so i'm just um working on little <laughs> tiny projects right now which is which is good mm. Beautiful. And Teresa, what are you working on tonight? Yeah, this is just, I'm doing this because I can't, um, I can't bead when like other people are talking <laughs> or I can, but it's just like so distracting and I'll just mess it up. <laughs> so just doing like, this is just easier to do, but then I'm doing this. I might try to do it. So, I don't know. I don't know if you can see. It's for um, someone has a medallion and they wanted um, a lanyard for it. So I'm just kind of copying. I actually think it's um, Adam's, one of his medallions. Oh. And so I'm just kind of copying his, whatever, his pattern. And so I, I was like, oh, I like those colors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to, I think like your red, you had it like, your red and blues are different from what I have, but. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of hoping it's like subtle. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Oh, it's beautiful. Thanks. So um, I can't really work on it right now because uh, like it, it's kind of in intricate, the peyote stitch. And then if everyone's talking <laughs> and then if I talk, because sometimes I go on and on and whatever, and then I'll just mess up my pattern. So anyways, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing this slam back one. <laughs> awesome. Well, and um, Britt, let me find you in all of the all of the screens here. There we are. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so <nice. laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I'm working on some uh, skull daisies. So I made one that was a, a patch for myself, and I've made them smaller. So these are going to be uh, earrings. So that's what I'm working on. Beautiful, amazing. Well, it's so exciting to see what all of our panelists are working on. Um, I do have a couple questions uh, for our panelists to think about and to, um, to hopefully contribute their thoughts and sharing to. And um, one of the first things that I was thinking about when thinking about this panel and putting together some, some questions for dialogue 
was um, how do each of you uh, see beating circles fitting into the broader context of decolonization movements? If anybody has any thoughts on that, that they Just would like to question to start. <laughs> it head on right now um well for me i think whenever you have a table with indigenous people around it being able to like free to talk about current topics um i think it's a way to build community but it's also a way to raise awareness about issues and it's a way to connect with each other um and so I guess I think that's the power of beating circles. And um, like the one I was organizing, there was lots of Northern theaters and it was so great to be able to share different kind of traditions and like stuff that we were missing out on because of COVID. Um, and I learned so much about like, I would call them sister nations, um, about different kind of ceremony that would usually happen in the spring that we were missing out on and um it just taught me a lot about those kind of things and it's so informal and it's a calm space so that emotions really don't go like rising because we're working on something and the way i was taught is you want to put good like thoughts and um like prayers and your beating and so you're in that state of calmness so then you may look at a topic in a completely different way. No, that's so true. Um, and I think that there's a piece there towards um, building and fostering community and kinship um, through beadwork and through the conversations that we have while we are beading uh, with one another. Um, would any of our other panelists like to share their thoughts on the question? For, for, for me, one of the, I mean, it's just like only one aspect of it, but um, the, the way that having like specifically online um, circles has really um, worked to erase like colonial borders for, for me and, and not, I think I didn't realize how much those borders were really in, inside my own, my own mind and my own understanding of how I saw um, myself and, and my own relationship to nationhood and all those kinds of things. And then when you have these online circles where, you know, uh, spaces and nations and countries and borders don't play into um, play into it as as far as just like actually preventing people from gathering. You know, like it's just so easy for people to log on to um, these different um, online supportive spaces from from no matter where they are. Um, that's really erased those kinds of um, for myself uh, in a way that feels really important. But obviously, I haven't quite figured out how to articulate it yet. Um, but it, yeah, I, f I feel like I've built kinship and, and, and family with, with people across borders in a way that I hadn't before. And maybe, maybe it's in the same way that I, that, that like when, when dancers talk about um, going on the power trail and making connections with, with family um, in other parts of the country and, and other parts of Turtle Island, um, maybe there's a, a kind of a parallel there too. Yeah, I think we've been good at, you know, creating those spaces um, in our communities, you know, and now that things have changed, um, that's just simply what the beating circle does and virtually is just to create that space to continue the conversations um, and to also expand it, like you were saying, right across borders and um, just kind of making that, that space even, even more accessible.
Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. (laughs) Sorry. I totally cut you off. I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say, like, I should have clarified this is my first virtual beating circle. I've been to lots of like in person ones, but just something to like, and and I mean, it's just, I agree with everything that everyone else has said, and you've all articulated it so well. But um, even just like when you go, you know, pre COVID, when we had Toronto Fashion Week in person and we had, you know, um, Attica and we had all of those festivals and it was just, you know, to get together with people in person and, and to be able to sit together was just, it was just so healing. And it was, so, it's so funny. Like I remember the first Toronto Fashion Week. I remember all of us knew each other by our like Instagram handles, but we didn't know each other like by our actual names. <laughs> and so we're just like yelling each other's Instagram handles across the field. And it's like, we'd built these online relationships already Um, and none of us had had, like, well, many of us had not had the opportunity to meet in person. And, uh, I think it goes to that conversation too, of like crossing those borders. Like we were all in one place. And, and I think like, this is just sort of a way that we've adapted something that was so beneficial to so many of us in so many different ways to kind of still be able to come together and be together in this space. Yeah, I think we shared, um, a table or something. We were under the same tent, right? We did. We did. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember my dogs freaked out one time. <laughs> <laughs> it was so embarrassing. <laughs> right. um, I, this is my first time doing like a virtual one. Um, usually I just like do it by myself and I do like, like I listen to a lot of podcasts and stuff. I've been listening to a lot of like Pam Palmer stuff like that I kind of find like COVID COVID time to be kind of like educational time Mm -hmm. so kind of catches catches me up on stuff but um I'm actually kind of interested in um hearing about like who comes online to these because there is a lot of like um like socio like economical like some people just don't have good internet on the res right Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know I'm just kind of interested um who's able to come online you know someone up north they don't have the best you know wi-fi if it's like if it is really accessible I'm just curious that's Mm -hmm. all I gotta say thank you (laughs) no that is actually a really great point accessibility and the privilege that is tied to uh the internet and accessibility of the internet is definitely a, a, a big thing to think about here. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, let's see. Any other thoughts from our panelists? Yeah, just um, as you mentioned accessibility, that brought another thing to mind too, as I find with um, in our community, um, for a lot of people, they're, they're not just be comfortable with using a computer even, or if it's, you know, and sometimes I feel like um, for our elders, um, seniors, um, there's, you know, there's some challenges there if they don't have, you know, if they're not comfortable with using the, com- the computer, if they don't have someone in the home like a grandchild or a niece or something that can help them. Yeah, there's definitely some issues around that too. A hundred percent, yeah. Um, so a little bit of a later question <laughs> to continue with our discussion. <laughs> um, would any uh, one of our panelists like to share of how they first got into beating or a story that they have um, that involves uh, a piece that they have beaded previously or anything like that? I laughed right away when you asked that question because I I do have a couple funny stories that I can tell but um, (laughs) um, my in my family like my grandmother's passed away when I was really young like I was one when my dad's mom passed away Um, but she had spent a lot of time with my mom beating before that Um, and my mom is not indigenous but she spent a lot of time with my dad's family 
And so she, when I was growing up and I was a kid, she would like always try to pass this knowledge down to me and teach me. And I was always beating like, I mean, not nice things, but I was a kid, you know, <laughs> like just kind of beating whatever. And um, this one day, my mom, she was like encouraging me to bead because I kind of put it down. And I was like, mom, I don't want to bead. It's your thing. And I just gave her like so much attitude about it. And I stopped for a really, really long time. Um, and to this day, like she brings it up regularly. Don't worry. Just to remind me that I said that to her. But uh, <laughs> she, when I, when I moved um, to Alberta, I was doing a lot of work. Um, like really, really heavy work. I was working like 80 hours a week doing consultation and negotiations and constitution building. And um, I found every time I was sitting with the elders, all I had was like difficult questions for them. And it was questions about like land and rights and um, development and all sorts of stuff. And it was like, every time we got together, it was just heavy. And so I really, it was important to me to sort of start to spend time with them in a way that wasn't always about these like tough discussions and tough topics in a boardroom. And like, it was, that was just super important to me to build that relationship and spend that time. And so I, I started working with this woman who she loved to beat. She was like a big time known beater in the community, but she was like tough, like tough, tough, tough. And she, um, she made me this pattern one day and I, I went home and I honestly worked on it for like probably eight hours a day for two weeks straight. Like it took me so long and I brought it down. I was like, just proud as punch. And I brought it to her house and I was like, look what I did. Like, I think I've got it. And she took one look at it and it was like, hmm, and threw it in the garbage. Like no word of a lie, just tossed it right in the garbage. <laughs> and she like, she cut out a new pattern and gave it to me and went, okay, like try again, keep going. And it just kind of became this like cycle for a really long time where like I would be so proud and I'd bring her this stuff down. And, and I mean, like she was an inc like a phenomenal teacher. She also was very encouraging in that too. But she, yeah, she just, I, so I don't have my first piece of beadwork. <laughs> it's, uh, it is long gone. But anyway, it definitely, uh, I was really lucky to have that opportunity to learn from her. But that's just kind of, I guess, that was how I first, first started to get into it. Well, that's such a funny and heartwarming and great story. And I, I just love that. And I love how it involves so much of your family too. And it's a beautiful memory. Thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> I think for me, um, when I started, I didn't start with beadwork right away. When I was a little girl, I used to do um, cross stitching because my mom um, used to embroider, like all like our baby blankets are all embroidered. Uh, our little, like she would hand make our clothes and she would like embroider that. So like, that's what I started um, to learn on. And then I wanted to learn how to bead. So she just like, we like, walked outside the house, went in the bush, grabbed a willow, made a bow out of it. And like, she taught me how to make a loom to do like that kind of stuff. But for applique beadwork, when I started, I like started and it looked not so good when, like when I was learning and my beadwork became much better when I sat next to um, the late Judy Lafferty and her sister, Lucianne, um, because they just like looked at my work and they do that thing where they just, you know, take your beadwork and like look at the back and they're like, oh yeah, that is not how you do it. <laughs> and then it was like really learning about, you know, doing um, like extremely neat work thinking about the tension of your thread, thinking about um, each line you do, you knot it, you're like, you make a very clean work. And um, just like all these lessons from sitting next to them completely change the way. Um, it just like, it's all these super like little techniques that completely change the way your beadwork looks. Wow, that's beautiful. 
Thank you, Tanya, for sharing that with us. <laughs> Would any of our other panelists like to share how they first got into beading? I'll share. Um, so we talked about this a little bit last week in um, Adam's uh, beading circle as well, like ta uh, remembering the first pieces that we beaded. So I started thinking about that and I dug mine out for today. And these are, I'd made the little hair ties. Oh. Um, and I was just looking at them now and I'm like, oh, one of them looks better than the other one. And yeah, that's often advice I give to first time beaters when they say, oh, this one doesn't look great or it doesn't, you know, um, and then I'll say, oh, your second one will look better <laughs> because the first time you beat the second one always looks better. Um, so I learned that at a kid's camp when I was uh, a teenager, young teenager, and um, I was a fancy shell dancer, so I wanted to learn how to make my own accessories. Um, so these are uh, hair ties, and then I ended up making like um, a couple of like hair ties and a choker and a back bread and um, yeah, for my regalia. And then uh, I was really inspired by uh, the powwow designs and, and regalia. And so I, would, I used to do a lot of like, when I first started, I would beat a lot of geometric style designs. And uh, I remember the first set, uh, well, maybe the second set that I did, it was um, where you fold the paper in four and then you cut out like the, the squiggly lines and then you cut out another one and then you layer them on top. Um, so I, I, that was one of the first sets that I did. So yeah, that's how, that's the story of um, how I first got into beating. That's amazing. It's really, to me, it's just like really special to hear how everybody got into beadwork because everybody's story is so personal and different. And I think it's a story that is all it's it's reminded every time we go to bead we think back to that first time that we beaded and we kind of look at our process from when we first started to where we are now and all of the memory that's tied to that so thank you Katie for sharing that's really beautiful so um I also have another question for folks, uh, and it kind of is tied into um, thinking about our, uh, our relationship to beadwork on a personal level. And I'm wondering if there are any of our panelists um, who have beaded something or who have received a piece of beadwork from someone uh, that has changed their life. or has impacted their life in some way. No, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I'll share. Um, I was doing my senior thesis for my, uh, to graduate at IIA. And um, I was working on a mixture of metalsmith and beadwork. And mm -hmm. then the beadwork piece took me longer than all of the other time consuming work. Like, like chasing and repousse is like building the pushing the metal out. It takes so much time. But then beadwork, I was like, why am I doing time consuming over time consuming work? Like, this is crazy. But I think it was really about finding my own voice through beats and finding my own style, um, which was super important for me as an individual was to have to create my own style of um, work, but there was still like, you could tell that it was Gwich'in. And I beat it and took it apart and beat it and took it apart. Like it was the longest process. I think it ended up taking me almost like three months to do like a tiny piece like this. And um, and then I realized I was like, holy, like 
Speed work is so intentional. You're literally making a decision at every single millimeter on your canvas, which is like moose hide for me. And I was like, you know, sometimes I joke around at the end of the day. I was like, I can't take any more decisions. I've stitched thousands of beads today. <laughs> it's just like, because it's so intentional, everything is placed um, the way you want it to. And um, so, so yeah, that definitely made me um, change my life. Because after that, I just went with... Um, how I had beaded for that first huge piece. Um, I have a story too about um, something that I'm not a lot of meetings last year. Um, I'm part of a group called the uh, River Women Collective here in um, my community, which is the uh, neighboring community of Nation and First Nation women. And last year we hosted the um, final installation of the uh, Walking With Our Sisters um, Bieber Camps here in Batash, Saskatchewan. Um, so it was a huge installation of over 1,500 um, bead camps that had been sent in um, to Christy Belcourt and her team. She had led the, um, the development of that art installation and that initiative for um, um, murdered and missing Indigenous women to bring attention to to that um, through the um, the beadwork vamp. So each vamp, um, someone would bead, and you could send it in over the years, and um, represented the life of a a murdered or missing Indigenous woman. And the installation traveled across Canada for five years. Um, so we had a group here of I think we were. 15 to or so women um, and we had like a grandmother's council that was part of our group um, so out of that work um, they asked me to make some grandmother shawls um, to honor our grandmothers that were part of that um, of that group so it was <laughs> When something is so near and dear to your heart, <laughs> you want to do such a good job. So it's almost like um, you're honored, but yet you kind of feel like that responsibility of you just really want to do a good job. Um, and I'm a designer as well, but beadwork is definitely something that I'm more comfortable with, but I do so as well. So I really wanted to make um, the shawls really special. So I made them out of velvet and um, out of silk velvet, which I'd never sewn before. So... <laughs> Oh my gosh, trying to sew them. There is definitely um, challenges. It was definitely not um, easy going, <laughs> but obviously there must have been a teaching and there was a learning in that, right? And um, and then I beaded a, um, a medallion for each of the, the shawls. Um, and then just um, when they're completed and we were supposed to um, gather together to present them was right when COVID started. So unfortunately it didn't happen yet, but I'm, so I'm holding these shawls and it just kind of, yeah, one of those times when beadwork always is, you know, very intentional and you're always um, care a lot about each piece, but that was definitely a, probably one of, or the most special project I've done. Thank you, Christine, for sharing that story. <laughs> really beautiful. I um, I I wish I was able to see that exhibition, but I've seen videos and and photos, and it, yeah, it's very um, very deep and and very beautiful. So, yeah, it was really uh, really moving, and it was it was unique. Um, as the last installation, it was the only installation that was outdoors. Um, you know, otherwise would have traveled like to art galleries and and indoor exhibits over the years. So, yeah, it was really it was quite something to walk the land in Batash and the homeland of the Métis. And well, it was all along um, a walking path down to the river. So, yeah, it was really beautiful.
I'm sorry, I dropped off there for a little bit. My computer crashed. Um, oh. so if you if you were, if you tried to call on me, I, <laughs> that's why I was gone. <laughs> oh no! Did um were did, were you able to be here for my the question that I asked? I don't think so. I repeat it. So I'm wondering um, if there's a piece of beadwork that you have beaded yourself or that you have received that has impacted or changed your life. Um, hmm. Yeah, maybe, I mean, I, so I recently, I guess not that recently, a while, a while back, I, I uh, decided that I wanted to um, make a medallion for myself uh, that um, could like illustrate my, um, my spirit name. And um, that name is one, so the, my name is uh, Stands by the Fire. Uh, and when I was given that name, it, I was um, really active as a, as a filmmaker, as a writer and director. And, um, you know, I, it was, it was an important experience being given that name. And I, the person who gave it to me told me a, a lot that really kind of um, shook me <laughs> in those moments. Um, but the, one of the things that he said was that, 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 that the name and then what my name means to me would change as, as I grew older and as my life changed. And at the time it was so clearly for me, it was so clearly about um, being a storyteller who is telling stories that were often really intense and and that that name stands by the fire was a, a, about being at that that gateway to this really um intense story place and 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 how that was a really fertile place to be um but also a place that was really dangerous um and and a, a place that's kind of a, a a gateway to this spirit world and um the human world and um, anyway, there's a, there was a lot, <laughs> there was a lot there. Um, and then um, I ha underwent a bit of a, a transition in my work and um, ended up being much more of um, uh, an advocate for, for indigenous um, filmmakers uh, and not making my own work because to, to make my own work while, while being in this advocacy position is kind of a conflict of interest. And um, through that time, it was working on my beadwork that I kind of discovered or, or rediscovered that, that those creative energies could be um, directed anywhere. And so that if I, if I wasn't writing and if I wasn't directing for, for film and TV, um, that energy could, could really be, be funneled into beadwork and, and I could find expression there. Um, but I, the, my relationship to my name also really changed because um, in that, during that transition, I realized that that name was also about being a helper um, and about supporting, supporting other people who are in that, that position of, um, of, of telling those stories and who are, um, you know, in some cases, putting their, themselves in harm's way by doing that and, and to be there to, to really, um, you know, do everything I could to, to support those, um, those artists. So, um, yeah, the process of working on that medallion was really a thinking through of, um, of that name, but also a thinking through of, of what that, um, what this time of my life is and, 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 um, what it means to to be somebody who's in that um, supporting role rather than kind of in the in the storytelling role um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But I've switched over now to working on a Dolly Parton. <laughs> <laughs> I've got somebody who's who's uh, commissioned me to make a, a, a Dolly Parton. Uh, piece to be framed. So lots of lots of little tiny beads in that base. 
Wow. That's so cool. I don't think I've ever seen a beaded Dolly Parton before. I think. Oh, I'm sure it's not the only one. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for sharing your story about the, the beaded medallion and, uh, and for sharing uh, Dolly with us. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, we get our inspiration from all places, right? Yeah. That is for sure. <laughs> um, a, another question, um, or another thing that I've been thinking about a lot uh, lately when it comes to beadwork and if anybody wants to talk about more about this, but um, I think it's important to think about uh, mm -hmm. beadwork as a slow and sustainable design practice. So if any of our panelists would like to speak towards that. Hmm. A slow and sustainable practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for me, I um, it's extra slow because I I usually tan the hides that I um, beat my work on, and I tan the caribou hides that I back my work with, um, and so it starts far before I um, I even draw a pattern. And it's all about connection to the lands and being able to build community with community members and hunters and elders and um, young people that you mentor and that you teach and stuff like that. Um, so in that way, it's very sustainable because it's about rebuilding the connections that residential school and colonialism try to uh, eradicate. Um, and it's also about, um, I worked with, um, a, like, a, I, um, when I started to decide that beading is something that I wanted to do, and I had done research in museum collections, uh, when I fell in love with the color palette of like antique and vintage beads, um, I decided to only use them um, because it was all dead stock so it had been produced 30 100 years ago and it was not part of that cycle meaning that um i was not part of that industry i guess um for glass beads um and it would i was hoping that it would like balance out the usage of like silver and gold which is a mining component and like figuring out how do I feel about using resource extraction for um, for like creating like to be part of my work? And then I realized that that had less of a negative impact than if you think about fast fashion and the idea of using cheap and toxic metals um, in your work because then people would value your work more and were less likely to buy one of your pieces just for a season or like um, just for a short time and to like let it go, let go of it. So it was really about creating that, um, really sharing the story of like what kind of work it takes so that people could really appreciate it and could take care of it. Because as soon as you know how much work there is in it, then you won't be like, you know, going, just taking it off and throwing it <laughs> when you walk in the door or like whatever. Like it's something that's precious and, and intentional. And it's not something that you're just buying all the time. It's like you have one piece and you really, really mm -hmm. um, appreciate it. And um and then you might invest in another one in the future, but it's not something that you just like that, like that pushes that um, production to a point where um, it's no longer unsustainable. And the other thing is also like listening to your body 
and really taking care of your body um, because the way I see it is um, I want to have like a, do this for a really long time. And so it's really learning um, how to stretch your body, how to look up and focus on a point every 20 minutes when you're beating <laughs> for hours on end, uh, how to like exercise your hands, your arms, your back, your core, so that um, you can work out on the land, you can lift big stuff, you can cut wood, you can stretch hides. And it's like, it's all these weird muscle groups that you wouldn't usually use. So really thinking about your body, not so much in a Western way, but thinking about how you can take care of your body so you can do the activities that you want. So like, I may have developed like, bigger forearms and big traps and like strong hands but at the same time for me that's something that I'm really proud of because it shows the type of work that I do so I guess that's like my sustainability on different aspects yeah and that's it's so true and I mean that's something that I think a lot of beaters um sometimes don't uh, pay as much attention to as they should, even including myself. And, you know, we all hear the term like beater's back. Uh, you know, you start to feel that pain in the back of your neck. And, you know, that's obviously your body telling you to take care of yourself um, so that you can continue uh, this work that we're all doing for a long time. So it's a very important point. Thank you. I almost want to say like, let's all do a group stretch, <laughs> lift up your shoulders, <laughs> put your hands back, <laughs> get out of your position. <laughs> I was just thinking that as I'm kind of sitting like this, like, oh my God. <laughs> do, you, um, do you have any stretches that you would recommend, Tanya? <laughs> yeah, um, um, so I guess also it's like, so important to think of like ergonomics for your like workspace so like you put your feet flat on the ground even if you're on the, your couch or your bed and then you stand up straight and then it's like the one where you it's almost like you push the wall back mm -hmm. and then it really like opens like stretches these this um these ones should be done often like even if you stretch before you start working you need to like warm up your muscles so it's like pulling this and then I had like a car accident where someone rear-ended me and it really messed up my nerve in my hands and uh in my arm so my doctor gave me the funniest stretch so I will allow you guys to laugh because it's very funny <laughs> But it's um, taking, like, doing like this and doing, like, glasses. Ooh. And it, like, stretches your, like, your whole nerve in your arm. And, like, sometimes when you work a really long time, it feels good. And just your regular, like, like these exercises, these stretches. And you just want to get your um because usually what happens is you end up slouching so these mu muscle like uh, shrink and then that's when you start having back pain so you really want to open up that so sometimes it's also standing up and like pulling your your hands down so those are just some of the stretches <laughs> <laughs> well i'm definitely going to use all of those <laughs> from now on <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, and that also kind of actually uh, links into another question that I've that I wanted to ask you all um, about beadwork as a practice of decolonial care and not necessarily um, in relation to our bodies, but also just care um, amongst one another as a community, um, especially right now uh, within the pandemic. Um, thinking through how can we think through beadwork um, as a practice of care. And so I think 
Tanya, there's a lot of things that you just talked about that uh, that um, relates to that. So, um, I read a book um, uh, by Christy Belcourt. It was on her beadwork. It was about her beadwork, um, and I've actually never been. I lost the book, and I didn't even get to finish it. Um, which sucks. And then I've never been able to find it again. I don't think it sh it's being published anymore, which sucks even more. But um, uh, I only got the first chapter. The first chapter she wrote about um, back in the olden days, um, I don't know how back, but um, if like, if someone lost, like um, if someone was going through grief or if they, you know, they lost a partner or whatever, um, they would give um, they would give that person beads and say bead this, and um, it was a way like to cope with the grief, but also because it's beading, um, beading is like a mental thing because you really have to concentrate, right? And it's also you're busy using your hands and stuff. So um, I kind of forget what your question was, but it reminded me of that um, what Christy said or wrote. What was yeah, your question? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that definitely uh, relates to the question talking about beadwork um, as a practice of care. So, yeah, then I'm on point. <laughs> yeah, totally on point. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I um, I want to know what that book is. <laughs> I wanted to read more. <laughs> oh my god! And I I don't think it's like a major publisher. I think it was just like something she had done maybe when she first started or something. I, I don't know. I don't know. I would love to read that or finish the book, honestly. <laughs> well, if anybody in the group knows Christy, maybe they can ask her. <laughs> they can ask her for us. Yeah. A mass run on the printers. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add, it's it's maybe not like a particular answer to any one of these questions. It's just like some thoughts. And it's just kind of to, to add on on what Tanya is talking about and also just to sort of come at it maybe from a bit of a different angle as well. But I think like um, for, for a lot of us, because a lot of us who are, who are on here, like there's some of us who have now chosen to also do beadwork as livelihood. And that gets complicated. It gets really complicated. And I think it, it, um, it can sometimes get like with the use, sorry, I'm trying to like articulate myself properly. But like, there can sometimes be when you, when you start to put your work out there and you have this huge community of people that, you know, when you have like, let's say a public profile on social media, like you can't necessarily control the people who are coming into your space. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about things like slow fashion and those sorts of things, like there is a, a phenomenal community of beadwork artists and indigenous people and who understand like how much time it takes to tan hides and to source materials and to do beadwork. But there's also a massive community out there of people who don't understand that. Um, and I think that there's also a really, really long history of, you know, indigenous people devaluing our own work and being devalued and you know like my dad tells these stories all the time both my grandmothers were quill, mark, were quill work artists and he would help them get the quills when he was a kid and like they would make quill baskets for this like gallery that was on our reserve and they would get paid like five or ten dollars to make like massive quill work baskets and so when you like then start to enter a space where you know, like I, I remember I went to this market. I'll never forget this. I was at this market and um, it was like a predominantly um, like it was pretty like a hipster neighborhood. It was not an indigenous art market. Um, at the time, there was only two indigenous artists who were at this market. And I remember there was like this family that came up to my table and they were asking about beadwork. And, and I mean, there's also a long conversation about accessibility here, too, that I don't want to ignore. It's important. But I was like, I forget what it was. It was like a, I forget what it was, but it was like a, a piece that I had in like a glass showcase. And it was like sterling silver beads and sterling silver and moose hide and all this stuff. And I think, I don't know, it was priced at like two or $300. And I literally got like, they laughed in my face. Mm -hmm. And it was like, and so it, I think that, and it, I wasn't hurt by that. I was more hurt that for so long, 
we've devalued ourselves so much that we can't see the amount of work and time that goes into those pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just, it's just like another important, like as much as we all have our own practices and we know that value and we're doing that work within our community to, to recognize those things, like there is also that sort of outside pressure element to it. But sometimes like where I was kind of going with this too, is like in that space, there's a real disconnect between sometimes between the individual and the work. And so you kind of, when you're putting work out there, I think sometimes there ends up this disconnect that there's like a human being behind that. And I find like whenever, you know, I have had so many conversations with so many people on here and off of here um, privately about like, this is, you know, this is happening or have you experienced this or have you like, and I think even that community of care that beadwork has provided for me is just so unbelievable because when you start having those conversations, like you realize that we're not alone and we're all experiencing these things and we're all, you know, and I think like that's been so huge. And, and for me, like, yeah, I, I just, I really wanted to, sh to share that piece of it too, is that like behind the scenes, sometimes like people don't necessarily see all of those things, but you know, we don't just like pop online and don't give any care to sort of like how we are sourcing materials or pricing things or doing, you know, and there is a lot of a thought behind that. And, and, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with care as well. And like, I think about, um, I, I'm just learning to tan my own hides and I, I have thought a lot about how in a community traditionally like we all wouldn't have done every single thing ourselves mm -hmm. and so for me it's been really important like I have a, a wonderful community who are phenomenal tan hider like tan, um, hide tanners sorry and I know like they have they have families of kids like I've known these kids since they were born you know and so like when I'm purchasing a hide from them like they, they're not beadwork artists and they don't want to be they want to tan hides and they want to go hunting for their families and so for me to be able to purchase a hide for them like that is care to me you know and that's providing care to one another in and like that's when I'm able to price my pieces that make me a living wage I'm able to pay them a living wage instead of just sort of continuing this circle of like every, everything being undervalued. And to me, like that's just another huge piece of care. And so I just wanted to add that to the conversation. I think I, I also just wanna to add to just sort of jump off what Jamie was saying, um, as far as the uniqueness of the beadwork community online, the indigenous beadwork community um, in, sort of uh, uplifting each other and empowering each other to take those steps and make those decisions. It's, it's really, uh, it is a bit of a minefield in, in selling the work and thinking of all of these things as well. But I do think that, that again, that is something unique to our, um, our online community of bead workers because it is possible because it is such a slow and sustainable fashion and we're making heirlooms for people um, that we we really can empower and encourage each other um, uh, to, to do that. Um, but I, I, I have seen those things as well and heard those things. I've had people try and undercut in my comments, um, but for the most part, it really has been um, like really engaged and supportive. Um, so th that's been really uh, incredible and just something I kind of wanted to add to the uniqueness of the community. Yeah, you've touched on so many, um, both of you, on so many things that came to mind for me too. Um, I'm enrolled in the um, Indigenous Fashion Support Program right now with Ryerson University. Um, we just started a few weeks ago. Um, and those are the exact kinds of conversations that come up as far as like unique challenges or unique <laughs> things that come up um, for us as Indigenous um, entrepreneurs. Um, and there's also, um, we have these conversations about there's, what's unique is that there is that education component, right? Because they don't know what's involved in tanning a hide and um, they don't know when you know, the hours of beadwork and what goes into it and um, all of that. So we almost, we're so unique that we almost have um, a whole nother side of, you know, when we take this on as an entrepreneur, um, we have things like responsibilities to our communities that a lot of entrepreneurs 
may or may not have where we've got strong connections to our traditions and our heritage and we we're, we're honoring that and i think that's kind of been my take of as i'm trying to build my business um i want to honor that and how can i serve my community um and build a sustainable business maybe a business that's going to support other creatives other indigenous artists um but yeah and i i'm feeling like right now there's a lot of curiosity about um indigenous artisans and entrepreneurs um but there's also um a lack of understanding or knowledge where we're just having to yeah kind of weave um sort of that education into almost everything that we do um it's kind of interesting because you like i have um on facebook i have i'm in a, like different beadwork groups or whatever i follow and you see people selling their stuff and they really um undersell it and it's kind of tricky because I think a lot of people who sell it for cheap, like are broke and really need this fast money. Um, so it's kind of like a fine line. They do take away, but yeah. also like, you know, baby's got to, got to eat, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Also, and someone, I, um, someone oh, made a little <laughs> thing for like 80 bucks. It was like a full on lanyard for like, she was trying to sell it for 80 bucks and I almost died. But, anyways, they <laughs> could have made like 200, but whatever. And it's, it's, I, I know yeah. that, 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 that reminds me as well, too, that something that I've been really fortunate. Um, one of the teachings that I had when I started beating was around um, sharing and giving away a lot of my work. And I was fortunate in the position that I was in um, working other jobs that I was and, and not having children or other obligations. I was able to make work and to do that and build into monetizing my work in that way. Um, so it was slow and I feel like happened in, in um, a good way, but I recognize that not everybody like you're saying, has the ability to do that or the ability yeah. to, to wait for something to sell. Um, so like, I appreciate you bringing up that nuance. It is really complicated. It is, but I think if me and like, I don't have kids either, you know, blessed. Um, I don't want them. But um, I think like um, the ones like me and you who are in this position, maybe if we start just like selling high and be like, no, this is my worth you know, what you're buying is my worth. I think eventually, like, you know, the single mothers who are doing it to feed, you know, get food, maybe they can start selling higher too, you know? Absolutely. I think that you're a hundred percent right. Um, and that I know, I know that, um, it's another thing I love about the community. I feel like, um, the more people sort of grow in popularity in online spaces, I see a lot of people using that to promote and share folks that maybe don't have that access and that reach, um, to make that a little more possible. And I've literally, even at the last indigenous fashion week, I had someone that I really admire come up to me, um, and ask my prices and be like, you should be charging at least double that. Um, and that was a great learning experience for me. Uh, and she was right. Um, <laughs> so I'll do that too, and like message and talk with other people because it's a hard position but you're absolutely right it's such a fine line with prices too I think I had I always have this conversation with beaters too because it's like you know not everyone's like old money you know <laughs> so you know most people are working if they can these these days for me that's why I decided to only sell online because people are just plain nasty in person and sometimes they're even nasty online but that's you can block them so it's okay um but it's really like setting your boundaries and realizing what kind of interactions you're open to or not and like how much time you allow people to take away from you especially if they're being nasty um and then the other thing about the pricing um there like i think there's also this whole idea about money um that is so like i i guess like there's this one class um workshop that's happening it's called the trauma of money and really looking at the traumas that are around money in like your life and what kind of relationship you had money uh, with money throughout your life, but also the values around capitalism 
and um, our work in our like the values of our nation. Um, I think many time, um, like I remember one of the calculations to sell your moccasins on the website of like the um, up north the, the the government for the arts was like oh take your materials plus your time and then add profit to that and that's your price and a lot of people like don't have that idea of profits i think oftentimes profit is like almost seen as a sense of greed being like uh, i'm taking away something from somebody else so it's really about learning how to price your work that goes around your value as a person and having more education about finances um like like even if it's organizing that kind of work in our communities because it's really hard to set up like like um, a number and really under for me it was understanding that what I'm offering is so unique and has so much thought and care and love around it that people really want that they want something that they can attach all those good feelings when it, whenever they see it it brings them so much happiness so understanding that my artwork gave that to people and so that's what they were buying they were not buying an object that was like replaceable. It was something unique. I just want to add to that too, like the that money piece and people's trauma around money. I think like I know for myself, like I have huge trauma around like money and finances and like, that's a, it's always been there for me and, and whatever, but it's like, I, I do get sometimes, you know, I think about like, there's this one situation where I used, I know this group of elders in Manitoba who harvest sweetgrass and they go out and they harvest sweetgrass and they braid it and they sell their braids and they're super long. They're like, as long as my body, these sweetgrass braids. And they're thick and they're gorgeous. And I was buying these sweetgrass braids and I got like a lot of people saying like, you shouldn't buy medicine, you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't commodify sweetgrass and you shouldn't, you know, and I, I, I am not talking about like a holistic shop that's selling sage bundles. I'm not talking about that. But why shouldn't I compensate that elder for their time? Because at the end of the day, like, and, and, you know, like people are going to disagree with this and that's okay. But it's like my, my like good wishes don't pay their hydro bill. Right. <laughs> and like our elders deserve to like be able to be warm and comfortable and all of those things. And not just the elders, but like, you know, there's young community members too in that where, where I was living that tan hides. And it's like, I know like this one, they have eight kids. And so it's like, yeah, I'm going to pay you like a fair living wage for that hide because you're supporting an entire family with that. And so like, I think people do have such trauma around money and cost and those sorts of things that it's like, it's such an important conversation to have in this space because I think that's care, right? And like, I know that there's a lot of like negative stuff tied to capitalism and, and all of that sort of thing. And that's an important part of the conversation too. But at the end of the day, like, I mean, I've, I think that it's important that we also provide that care financially sometimes too. And, and, you know, that we're able to keep practicing and doing all these things. And, you know, someone said too, like, if you have single moms or you have like, you know, like we have clients and we have people who reach out to us that say, you know, I just graduated and this is sort of my budget. And I know there's so many beadwork artists who work one-on-one -on -one with those people. And it gets really complex when you have a social media presence, because if you're constantly going, oh, look at all these great things I did, you're, you're probably doing them for the wrong reasons. And it's considered, you know, you're super performative, but it's like, if you're if you don't say anything about those things and you're kind of constantly getting criticized about about it from the other side right and so it's it's a difficult position to be in and at the end of the day like for me I've done a lot of work to just know that what I'm doing I'm doing for the right reasons and I like I believe in those things and I think that's kind of where we have to settle at the end of the day because there's always going to be people who are really critical of that but I just think you know I really appreciate Tanya bringing up that that trauma like around finances I think it's so important
it was that a book, Tanya? Did you or is that like where did you say you read it somewhere or? Oh, it's a workshop by uh, oh, I'm totally gonna butcher her name. I think it's Tracy Sh Chapman. She's based out of Vancouver. Um, I first heard of, about it last year when uh, they did a workshop with Entrepreneur. Um, and then this year I took the workshop. And then before that, I had done a workshop with somebody else around, um, it was more, it was like more around love, <laughs> like showing, it's like, um, like taking away your mind of like selling your work as capitalism, but really giving gifts to people of like what you're doing or something like that. So, um, but yeah, but on your point, um, Jamie, like I think it's always fair to, um, you, we have to compensate people for their time. And there is always that line of, oh, you can't buy this, you can't buy that in our community. But it's the same for like, you can't buy like skins or stuff like that. But I'm like, I'm buying the bullets for the hunter or I'm buying the gas for the hunter or I'm helping them do their payment for the skidoo or I'm helping them like, like paying them for the hours it took them to skin the um animal properly and to pack it in a good way and then bring it back to town like you can instead of saying like oh i'm buying a piece of caribou i'm buying a moose you're like i'm actually paying for like all the things that made it possible for that hunter even if it's new mucklucks new like mitts or whatever like that's how I try to think about it and it's not trying to like nitpick, but it's really like, it takes so much work and effort. Like, and you don't even count the amount of time someone may go hunting before they even get an animal. You don't count all the like three weekends and they didn't see anything or they missed a shot or whatever. So people will always find something to be nasty about. And it's just about learning to be kind to others. Well, thank you for all of that insight. It's absolutely incredible. And I know everybody who's watching is just have so much gratitude right now for everything that all of you have shared. Um, I have a couple other questions, but I do think that it's important to open up the space for questions from our, the audience and our viewers. Um, I know that there might be some in the chat um, and also any other um, things that our panelists would like to discuss, feel free to share. But yeah, I think it's I think it's good to open it up to to some questions. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I uh, I got a question. Um, so uh, someone was working on like working on like a big tracing here and uh, I was just wondering how you're gonna affix it to to the material like I thought the size might be an issue um, could you maybe talk to us about your process he's working on a big what it was uh, I think it was and you were doing but then also uh, I think it was Katie who was working on a, like a big piece. Um, yeah, uh, could you maybe talk about your work? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I trace it onto the tracing paper and then um, I usually take like white glue and then I'll, I buy um, Flexi Firm from Fabricland by the roll, like by the meter I mean. So um, I'll just put glue all along the edges and then some like dots of glue in the middle and then I'll put it on the big piece of flexi firm and then I'll take some like heavy books and then I'll put it on top for a day or overnight so that when it dries the papers dry right onto the flexi firm but it's also like nice and flat to work on and yeah then that's that's ready to be beaded. Flexi firm was it? 
Yeah, Flexi Firm. Where do you get that? Uh, I get it from Fabric Lens. Um, it's also, it's sometimes it's called Pelon, but it's like a Pelon brand, and then the name of it's Flexi Firm, and it's usually in the, um, what's that stuff called? The interfacing section of a fabric store. Oh, awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So there's a question from the chat from Kimberly and Janice, um, and they're asking, what is everyone's favorite way or style of beading? Hmm. I mean, I, I basically just do um, different kinds of bead embroidery. Um, I, I feel like I, I, I don't know, I kind of, I kind of like mostly everything <laughs> about it. Although I've tried to do some geometric designs and I realized um, that one of the things that I really appreciate and love about um, uh, a lot of bead embroidery is is the movement in in a design and um, beading beading curves and and beading just like seeing all of those lines of, of beads flowing into one another um, and so I don't often find that geometric beading as satisfying but um, yeah I guess like bead embroidery with lots of lines curved lines. <laughs> I do um, just the single needle lead work. Um, I tried to two needle and it's just kind of not for me. <laughs> so I just do the basic um, single needle bead work. Um, and I do a lot of flowers um, just based on my own um, Michif heritage. Um, a lot of it was um, floral, like scrolling florals kind of thing with uh, lots of greenery. Um, I look at historical uh, beadwork and sort of get ins inspiration from that, but I don't do sort of, you know, um, really um, like technically sound specific flower. <laughs> my stuff is just kind of my own take. It's very sort of stylized, like I use lots of pinks or lots of combinations of different colors. So just kind of make it my own, my own style or my own um, my own look just kind of what's visually um appealing but i kind of start with a lot of traditional stuff and kind of take that as inspiration maybe to um to expand on kimberly and janice's question and kind of expanding on what you were just talking about uh christine um thinking about uh, sources of inspiration, maybe some of our panelists can talk to how they, um, or where they find uh, inspiration for their work or for their, for their beading style. Something um, that, that people have talked about tonight that's really resonated with me is the idea of making um, making pieces that are going to be heirlooms for, for the, the, the people that are uh, that we're making them for and um, that's something that I've thought about a lot just because I, I do work mostly um, on commission and so I, I get a lot of inspiration from the people that that I'm making the work for so whether it's um, talking to them about um, plants or flowers that they have a special relationship to uh, or different kinds of materials that they have a relationship to or, a, a, you know, just a, a, a little story that they want to tell. Um, you know, there I, I did a, a bolo not very long ago for somebody who had seen other work that I did and they, they, they liked that work, but they said, well, that, that their grandmother had recently passed and um, she was a huge card player. 
And so they wanted me to have to, to beat a little like um, spade shape into into the, the center of this this floral bolo to honor their grandmother. And I just I, I love that because it's the kind of thing that I would never I would never necessarily think to do that. And it's not something that is necessarily meaningful to me, but combining the materials that I have and, and the inspiration and stories that other people have and, and, and bringing them together um, is something that's like just endlessly exciting and rewarding. And, you know, I, I definitely have color palettes that I'm drawn to and, and um, I really love a lot of old style florals. Um, but uh, but that's my favorite part is, is really talking to people about what they're looking for and what's going to be meaningful for them. I know too that um, I draw a lot of inspiration sort of from um, the complicated nuance and layers of modern indigeneity and, and, and I know that I um, I'm heavily influenced by tattoo and pop culture um, and ways to indigenize those images and ways to mo modernize them in a way where you can incorporate them every single day to um, more fully represent all of who you are in all of your interactions and your experiences. So. Um, Definitely my work in tattooing uh, uh, has heavily influenced that. Um, and it's like earlier with Adam beating Dolly Parton, um, anything can influence you. You can love anything. There's so many things that make up uh, the, the layers of our, of our identities. And I think that um, any way that we can celebrate and express that is really exciting. I actually, um, just to to go on the flip side, I am like, I'm, I'm so in awe of, of artists who still, who do most of their work on commission, because I actually found commission started to just like suck the life out of me. Because I found that like, um, I was running into a lot of cases where people wanted my work to look like someone else's or people wanted themselves reflected in my work or they want to end I found it started to like, it was really hindering like my creativity. And I was producing pieces that I was like, this isn't something that I would produce. This isn't something that you would see on the street and be like, oh, that's White Otter. It started to reflect like what other people wanted from me. And so that's kind of when I switched my, my model. Like I will, I'll still do it occasionally for like a wedding or a graduation or, or especially if it's somebody that I know where I can sort of, you know, like really capture the essence of that person. But for the most part, like, I really like the creative freedom of just being able to make whatever I want whenever I want to make it. And I find that, like, I think beadwork has a way of, like, finding the person that it's supposed to get to. And I think, like, there's a lot of magic in that for me. And, and for, as far as inspiration goes, like, I... I mean, of course, like the land and being outdoors and, and those sorts of things are incredibly inspirational. But I also get a lot from dreaming and it's it's actually like quite complicated for me and I I haven't yet like I've kind of talked to a couple people about it and and like I found a few people that I've had a really similar experience with but I feel like it's really deeply personal for me but I do have a lot of like I get a lot of inspiration um in like a, a dream time sort of a state and and that's um I guess that's where a lot of that comes from for me but um, I also like when I was working in, in boardrooms, I was always like, I was kind of going into these scenarios where for me, I was like, I don't necessarily want, I couldn't at the time. And I mean, now I've been exposed to so much and there's so much out there. It's different, but you know, at the time, even for me, like not kind of knowing this community and not, not being exposed to this level of work, I was like, I'm not comfortable going into say these situations with, um, say like I don't know like my regalia or like my ribbon skirt or and I for me I felt like there was like a real ceremonial time and place for those things 
but I was like, how do I, like, I felt like I couldn't find pieces where I could like reflect my indigeneity in those spaces in a way that really reflected like my style and my comfort and those sorts of things. And so for me, it was kind of, that's kind of how I started too, was I was like, I want to design pieces that I would want to wear um, every single day, not necessarily to be like dressed up for an event or a ceremony or et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, for me, I, I guess I try to connect with my matrix through, um, like my mother and my grandmother who, uh, both passed away. So it's like bringing back their work into my work. So it's super special whenever like an auntie or like uh, some, some friend would be like, Hey, this is your grandma's pattern. I thought you might be wanting to use it in your work um so bringing those things back and also um like what inspires me is is using materials that are like in, in techniques that are very northern uh, so that <clears throat> you might not be able to have like your big mucklucks your moccasins like on the daily or what your grandparents used to use, but um, I really thrive to creating work that has that feeling. And that's why I love using like the, like witch and florals and stuff like that. And like, even like, um, and then it comes to materials. So usually I have, I love to make big pieces, like big earrings so that you walk in and you're like, boom, and people like see you and stop you in the street and stuff like that. But then like, I was taught to like not waste. So then when you cut a big piece, usually you have your, all the small pieces. So for example, like my studs or my smaller pieces are literally scraps. So I usually have like my big pieces and when I cut them out I end up with like all my scraps and then from my scraps I'll design new jewelry pieces so that I'm like whenever I have too big of a bag of scraps I'll design pieces that are for the smaller pieces so I think that's also like when you work and then you're like oh I have all these other things and then you create more stuff so definitely um yeah that like fun stuff. <laughs> so there's a, another question in the chat from Jack and I'm actually gonna let Jack ask it because it's a really great question and I feel like I won't do it justice in my own <laughs> words. Uh, so my question was, sorry, where is it? So there's a question in regards to Indian bling. I mean, that's just what I call it. And it's what I'm referring to is, I mean, technically it could be any native, popular native style of beadwork or jewelry, but specifically this style that's more or less very similar across the plains in the woodlands area. Uh, and it's, uh, it looks like candy and a lot of people wearing necklaces or earrings, uh, even in street stuff. So the question is, uh, do we like that Indian bling is not mainstream? Because that means bead workers aren't making as much money as they could. But at the same time, this aesthetic rests in our hands. And we as Native communities, uh, not just bead workers, but the people who, the Natives who purchase and wear this jewelry, all of us together, we maintain and we maintain and control ownership uh, over the, over this aesthetic. Miigwech, uh, that's all. Hmm. <clears throat> like, do we want to see a bunch of white people wearing our Indian bling? Like, I personally, but well, what if it gets to a point to where they're all wearing it 
and then other companies start to copy that aesthetic companies halfway across the world who don't even know us copy that aesthetic and start profiting off of that but like getting people involved in working conditions that are unethical for example it's complicated yeah it's an interesting question because i think like um i think the the the, the indian bling um kind of copies mainstream designs and it's kind of our way of being like you know i'm i'm still tradish but i got some flash <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, um, cause like I'm from Saskatchewan and everyone, everyone wears them. Um, I don't know. I don't think that, I don't think it will be mainstream. I, I, I don't know. It's so hard to say because when something becomes way, like mainstream, that means, um, it's gotta be popular with white people. Right. So, and everything culturally becomes yeah. in waves, right. Um, so it's it's hard to tell what white people will like. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Cause you know, um, everyone was scared of people wearing like beards, right? They're like, oh, you're a terrorist if you have long beards. But then oh, white yeah. people start seeing them and then all of a sudden it's like super trendy, right? So I I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question, but it's um I even if it does That's okay. <laughs> Even if it does become trendy, I think like natives are so native, we'll just make another thing, you know? <laughs> we'll just make it our own some kind yeah. of way. I don't, know. I don't even know if that answered your question, but it's a good- I also feel like sort of to build on what you're saying, Teresa, that like we, we make sure that there's credit there. Like generally anytime that I see a certain celebrity wearing beadwork, like there'll be people in the comments or whatever, like whose beadwork it is, recognizing it, crediting it. Um, or like the mm. stuff that's happening with Rosary Spence right now and her muck yeah. being duplicated. Um, I, I think that there are sort of ways around that. And I agree with you. I don't know how yeah. the, the trendiness will, yeah. <laughs> the waves of the trend will go. But as far as, as that, I see us like advocating for ourselves in those spaces. And it's interesting about trends because they're trends, right? Like they don't last long. They're like, you know, they peak and then they get tossed away like, everyone was wearing um, mukluks, right? And now it just kind of fallen off and now it's just like natives. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think Thank the you. friends do have a lot to do with it. And, and so much of that is not really within our control and doesn't like doesn't concern us all that much. Um, and it's important to know that that yeah, all of all of those things will pass, and it'll be pretty. If if that does happen, it would be pretty short lived. And even looking at like like styles of patterning and and beadwork from like the the Southwest, like that's cycled in and out of mainstream fashion for a long time. And you know the the people who have been making that work. They, you know, they, they, they never stopped and, you know, the, the kind of pops in and out of, of pop, pop, pop culture now and again. And I think that, you know, there's definitely an enormous amount of revenue that's, that's lost for the people who are practicing that kind of design work. Um, but at the same time, like it, it's interesting that, that it always remains separate and that, that that way of practicing those those designs and that kind of work never really changes for the people who are doing it, even, even as those trends kind of come and go. Um, yeah, that's, it's, it's, yeah, I guess I don't know how to answer the question either. <laughs> No, I mean, it's complicated, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great question, Jack. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, 
Um, does anybody else have any questions for our panelists or um, is there anything that our panelists would like to share? Um, any little anecdotes or, um, I know we kind of talked about this throughout our whole conversation, but um, I think it's also really interesting to think about the teachings that are embodied within beadwork. And I know Tanya mentioned a couple and same with Jamie. Um, and I mean, within my own work, you know, there's the, the spirit bead, um, which is, you know, teaching and acknowledging humility. So um, if there's any other teachings that maybe the panelists would like to share that they have learned um, within their, their own um, uh, journey with beadwork or anything. Mm. And even anyone, if anyone, um, not just the panelists, but anybody in the group, um, feel free to answer as well. I'll share just a final thought and it's not necessarily like a, a teaching that I've received, but it's just something that I've sort of, I don't know, come to is like when I, when I was a baby, my grandmother passed away when I was one and my parents told me this story my whole life growing up that my dad laid me on her chest and she kissed me on the forehead and she said, one day you're going to do great things for your people. And when I was growing up, I was like, I felt pressure from that. And I felt like that meant that like, I had to serve like my individual small community. And I thought, you know, like I went to high school and then I went to university and then I went immediately into like doing community work and like came out on the other end of doing eight years of, you know, community building work with like complex PTSD and all kinds of other issues, right? And not that that work wasn't incredibly important and I wouldn't trade it for anything I needed to do all of that. But it's taken me a really long time to learn that like community doesn't necessarily mean your own like thousand person community. It can mean like our greater community. It can mean like our community of bead workers. It can mean like our great. And so for me, it's been like changing the lens on what community means has been it's been like freeing for me in a way that I actually feel like the work I'm doing the work that I was called to do and it's more effective because I'm like I'm doing what I was supposed to be doing and so I just wanted to share that like when we talk about you know I think for so many of us artists like contributing to community and giving back or or acknowledging or caring or all of those things are such an important part of what we do and I think it's just important to, to, for me, it's important to vocalize that, that community can mean a lot of different things. And we just really need to like hold space for that, I think. Um, there's, uh, I guess I'll, I wanna, I wanna add something. Um, Lately, I've been uh, asked to do more, uh, more and more workshops and different stuff, like um, especially my my bead weaving. I know how to make that contemporary geometric stuff, and bead embroidery too. But what I keep noticing is that, like, I keep getting. It seems to me, anyway, that uh, it brings me closer and closer to doing like community work and like working with like um, indigenous, homeless pop indigenous homeless population and things like that. Like, I'm here in based in Montreal, and I'm, I'm doing that work. Um, but I, I just kind of like, yeah, I kind of noticed the link between being drawn towards community work and uh, being a workshop facilitator. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, it was just kind of uh, really interesting to me. And it's kind of what's happening in my life right now. And I suppose um, I would like to end with a question uh, to both the panelists and everyone who's here. Um, is there a style of bead work that like kind of intimidates you, scares you, that maybe you'd like to try one day? Um, yeah. Portraiture. <laughs> Fair. Hmm. 
Yeah, I'm gonna say the same for portraiture. Also, I don't have like all the beads to do that to get the different, you know, colors and stuff. It's a big investment. <laughs> all those gradients. What? Those gradients. Yeah, it's a big investment. It, they gotta be someone special. <laughs> Well, since Janice and I are fairly new to it, majority of the beading <laughs> styles. <laughs> there you go. There's the input. I'm I think anything that requires counting, I'm always so impressed by um, the people who do the contemporary geometric or even anything with the peyote. Um, because man, just keeping keeping track of your count is so. I've, I've I've tried to do it a little bit, and I've only done, um, I've only been successful at doing uh, peyote when it was really like one color. Like I think Craig, you were working on an antler, and I finished an uh, one antler um, that was like in a couple of different colors, all all peyote, and I've, I'm halfway through another one. Um, but man, when I've tried to do a pattern. It's I'm I'm so intimidated and so impressed every time I, I see that that work. Yeah, flat peyote can be uh, tedious after a while. Like I uh, I made this QR code thing in a jig. This is flat peyote. Took me quite a long time to do it. <laughs> yeah. It works also, by the way. It, it, it's a working QR code. Nice. Uh, I linked it up to some poetry that I wrote. Um, but you got like yeah, this this was a new challenge for me. I never did a painting by numbers before. Uh, so the experience was quite new. I had to make sure every bead was on because if it wasn't, I mean, it probably would mess up the link, right? Yeah, so I'm always interested to see what uh, people's, uh, what you call it, sometimes bead aspirations, beading aspirations are. I, I just kind of find it fascinating. <laughs> For that QR code, did it work right away or did you have to go back and fix some things? Uh, no, it, uh, um, at first, I thought I messed up the code, but it turns out it was just my card reader. So I, uh, uh, the code reader, I should say. So I switched it, and then it ended up, it ended up working. That's awesome. By the way, everyone, I'm almost done my uh, little medicine bag here. Right. Well, it is, uh, it's almost at the end of our time. Um, and so any final thoughts from anyone or any closing remarks or things that you would all like to say before we sign off? Janice, who's being afraid to speak mm -hmm. for some reason tonight, <laughs> was saying that at some point she would like to learn how to do the 3D beating, but is absolutely terrified of it as well. <laughs> oh, I do workshops. Really? <laughs> I do. Check out my Instagram, you'll see that I have examples of 3D uh, uh, beadwork, including contemporary geometric beadwork. Good to know. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody, by the way. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Any other final words from our panelists? Thank you so much for having us part of your meeting circle. It was awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you to all the panelists and also to everybody who joined in tonight to listen to all the wise and insightful words and sharing. And I really appreci appreciate all of the storytelling that each of you did and for sharing so much with us. And I'm definitely feeling extremely inspired. Um, but before we all go, the Beating Circle has a weekly um, thing that we do and we always take a group photo. And so if you feel comfortable, <laughs> folks can turn on their camera. And I just take a little screenshot of everyone. Um, and you can hold up your beadwork uh, if you've been beading. And yeah, when everybody's ready, I'll, I'll do the little, the, the photo. One last stitch. <laughs>
Okay, I'm gonna change my light so you can actually. <laughs> this light's not getting any better, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make sure everybody's ready here. We all good? Okay, so countdown, three, two, one. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining Miigwech, Marcy, and wishing you all um, the best and have a great evening. And yeah, thank you. I'm just, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> right now. This is great. Thank this is you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye.